All right, good morning, everyone. We're just waiting on folks to connect to audio and enter in from the waiting room. Looks like a full house. <laughs> One side of the fence, then she's on the other side. I'm done. All righty. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining this morning's uh, Returning to the River Roadmap Stakeholder Session. My name is Sandra Miola. I'm the director of the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed. I'm just going to let um, a couple more folks into the meeting from the waiting room. Here we go. All right, so a couple of housekeeping items before we get into it. If you aren't speaking, please be sure to put yourself on mute to avoid any background noise for our speakers this morning. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be shared afterwards. A um, couple more folks in the waiting room admitting them. Uh, one of the coalition's watershed-wide priorities that we've adopted a couple years back was to amplify efforts aimed at achieving fishable and swimmable waterways for all uh, and we're doing that through cross-state collaboration on surface water quality standards, um, directed outreach, and so on. And this particular project aims to do just that with a, with a really clear focus on community engagement and equity. And in terms of the agenda, um, we'll first hear from Andy Cricken and Carl Russick with the Water Center uh, at the University of Pennsylvania on an initial summary of um, our existing state of recreation. And then we'll hear from Tim Dillingham, the executive director at the American Literal Society about the stakeholder process. And then finally, um, we'll close out with Don Baugh with the Upstream Alliance managing some questions in the chat box. And before we go further, I'm gonna turn it over to Verna Harrison for some additional housekeeping and how we're going to function as a, as a um, tiered system in terms of commenting. So Verna. Good morning and thank you all for joining. Um, I'm calling this our science fair experiment. We're trying to um, facilitate a robust conversation in this virtual age and this particular chapter of the roadmap, as you'll hear in a minute, relates mostly to recreation. So we've done a very I've done a very arbitrary split of people who are recreation experts or who may work more day to day in that arena and asked and you all to participate with your comments in the chat, the Zoom chat. And for those of you who are interested in this issue as far as the recreational impacts, but don't work on it day to day, please email me your comments. In all cases, you will have um, uh, an opportunity to hear the, uh, the responses if we don't get to a question in the chat or if we don't get to a question in the email, we will send out that response. And this will be recorded. And I will thank you for coming and turn it over to the Water Center. Uh, thanks, Verna. Should I uh, get started, Sandra? Yeah, go for it. Great. Uh, well, thanks, everyone. I appreciate uh, everyone coming out. Um, such a good group of people, a lot of uh, uh, friends, friends and friendly faces. And mute yourself, please. Uh, good to see a lot of friendly faces. And uh, um, my name is Andy Cricken. I'm a senior advisor at the Water Center in Penn. And uh, before that, worked in Camden at the wastewater utility there. And so I've been working with a lot of you for many years. I'm really excited to be working with Howard Newkrug, the former water commissioner at Philadelphia Water Department, and my colleague, Carl Russick, who will follow me um, at the Water Center now on a project to try to uh, develop a roadmap for the Delaware River with respect to water quality for the 27 mile stretch, the remaining 27 mile stretch that 
um, is not designated for primary content. I content. will talk to you later. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh, next slide, please. So there's the, there's the map, and as you can see that in, in yellow, that that's the 27-mile stretch of the Delaware that is, um, is not a designated for primary contact. And the goal of this project, it's, it's uh, funded by the William Penn Foundation, so my thanks to my friend Nate Boone from William Penn. Um, they funded the Water Center and the Returning to the River Action Team. You'll be hearing from Tim. We've already heard from Verna Harrison. You'll be hearing from Tim Dillingham and Don Ball, Ball later. Um, the goal of the project is to identify opportunities, water quality opportunities, water quality improvement opportunities for this 27 mile stretch. And the, the, the idea really is, is, is it's, a, it's a matter of, of environmental opportunity and also social justice. There's a 27 mile stretch of the river, the only 27 mile stretch that doesn't uh, have the water quality uh, opportunities that, that other, the rest of the, the Delaware River has. You have three cities, Philadelphia, Camden, and Chester, that are in economically distressed and environmental justice communities. And our aim is to try to identify low-hanging fruit, um, low-cost opportunities to improve water quality without adversely impacting uh, the ratepayers of these cities. Uh, next slide, please. So the project team is led by the Water Center at Penn. Uh, we have uh, our consultant, Michael Baker International, and I, I know that Julia Fine is on the call as well. Uh, we also have an advisory panel, uh, which are, consists of several uh, experts throughout the, uh, the field, and I see several of them are on this call as well. Plus, we're getting a lot of help from the Delaware River Basin Commission. I always want to thank my friend, not, friends Namsi Suk and John Yagachik for their help, and uh, Steve Tambini, the DRBC uh, commissioner, is on as well, which we appreciate. Also, um, we've gotten help from the Philadelphia Water Department and several other municipalities, as well as environmental community stakeholders. Um, the goal really is to work together to get the, the thought process of all of the, uh, the stakeholders in the river and all the, the thought leaders to try to see what um, can be done. Um, I should point out that you know, since the Clean Water Act was passed, the regulators, the clean water utilities, the environmental and recreational stakeholders have all done a great job over the past 48 the years to improve the water improve water quality in the, uh, the Delaware significantly. So in fact, that's what really makes this process possible is to be able to stand on the shoulders of that work to see we've come this far, how much further can we go to, to restore uh, swimmability, you know, primary contact designation for this particular stretch of the river. Um, and not only has there been a lot done, there's also a lot that's been committed to, to being done. Um, the Philadelphia Water Department is implementing their Green City Clean Waters Plan, which is a a, a nationally groundbreaking uh, plan for stormwater management. And so that, so water quality will improve as they continue to implement that. The Camden County MUA, my former utility is, is didn't have a consent decree because it didn't need one. It was volu it voluntarily agreed to undertake a, a long-term control plan on behalf of the cities of Camden and Gloucester to clean up uh, the combined sewer overflows from, you know, it's, it's um, combined sewer overflow impact onto the Delaware. So that work is continuing in Chester and Delcor have consent agreements that they're working on. So we expect that there'll be a significant amount of water quality improvement from the work that's ongoing. But then the purpose of this of the study is to see what of the among those things can be done, or will we'll have the most water quality impact and what remains to be done after that in order to achieve uh, you know, optimal water quality uh, benefit for, the, for this uh, area. Uh, next slide, please. As the, as, as, as the slide said, basically the goal uh, is to understand where we are, how far we are, how far we've come, how much we've progressed, how much we'll, we'll, we'll get, the benefit we'll be able to get just from what's already been committed to without additional commitment, and maybe look for some opportunities to accelerate some things that might have maximal impact. Uh, and then lastly, look for opportunities to do, go beyond that to see what else needs to be done in order to restore uh, this 27 mile stretch to uh, swimmability. And, and as Verna likes to say, uh, more people, more places, and more, more time, more frequently. Uh, the, the goal of the project really is, 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 since the Water Center at University of Pennsylvania is a, you know, an educational institution, we're not taking a side or any sides. The aim really is to try to um, come up with a, a, a common basis of facts that everyone can agree to that this is where we are, this is what's being done, this is what could be done, and for each thing that could be done, here are the projected benefits, environmental benefits, and community benefits, and here would be the corresponding costs. And then leave it to, to stakeholders um, to discuss and decide what makes most sense. Uh, we don't, 
I remember from my time as a water utility leader where there'd be you know, questions about whether it was worth it to spend this to do that, and we're not going to be involved with that. Instead, what we'll be doing is identifying the opportunities, benefits, and the, the cost, but at least there'll be a common set of facts and a common set of, op of opportunities that, that stakeholders can then decide among themselves. We hope in this way to advance uh, the project so that, or the, or the initiative so that ultimately it'll be easier for stakeholders to make the best decisions for the community. Ultimately, as I said, the goal is to achieve water quality as a benefit in and of itself, especially from the standpoint of social justice for these three cities, Philadelphia, Camden, and Chester, but to do it in a way that does not adversely impact those rate payers. With that, I'll turn it over to my friend and colleague, Carl Russick. Thanks, Andy. And um, as Andy said, uh, I think it's important to clarify exactly what this study does and exactly what the study is not intended to do. You know, we are not going to advocate for a specific path forward with the exception of filling key data gaps. One thing we know we will recommend is that more data is needed uh, and, you know, propose some, some options for very targeted additional data collection and long-term monitoring. Um, we're not going to be advocating for specific policy or regulatory changes. Uh, there are, you know, stakeholders, many on this call, that, uh, that is their role. Um, we're looking to inform that conversation. Uh, and we're also being very careful not to get out too far over our skis with respect to what the data shows. Uh, it's a very complex, complex environment um, and, you know, less data than we would like. Uh, so, you know, we'll be describing the, uh, you know, what we, uh, what we understand to be the state of the knowledge, not prescribing, just laying out options. You know, we're uh, sticking to the facts, if you will. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an outline of the project. We're at the beginning of this journey and I wanna make it, uh, make it abundantly clear to everyone that, you know, this, this is step one we're talking about here. You know, we've got a lot of activity going on in all of these tasks uh, throughout the process. You know, we've got a team of people working through the process, but you know, the way we've designed the project is to basically have check-ins, have a, 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 given the complexity of the situation, the, uh, the number of organizations, the amount of organizational knowledge uh, across, the, uh, across the estuary and across the, uh, you know, the community, we want to make sure we're taking advantage of that and also checking in along the way to make sure we have an opportunity for people to weigh in as opposed to dropping some massive report. Uh, in mid, you know, uh, you know, on the stakeholders in mid, uh, you know, mid 2021 and find out we missed something. Uh, so the first step is where we are now, we're, we're just, just attempting to describe, you know, where recreational use is happening and also describing, you know, setting up a lot of the background uh, to inform further study. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, second tab is getting more into the, the meat of the technical underlying issues as far as you know, what, what do the numbers mean as far as uh, EPA guidance and, uh, um, and, you know, what does the data tell us? The third piece is very much a, a data crunch, crunching exercise uh, about really getting into, you know, finding correlations, finding, you know, finding what the data will tell us about, uh, about when and where uh, water conditions may be suitable, you know, water quality may be suitable for, uh, uh, for swimming. Um, then we're getting into options for monitoring and decision making. Uh, so if, if you are going to, you know, move forward with uh, creating additional opportunities for swimming in these sections of the Delaware, what would you need to have in place as far as, you know, modeling and monitoring tools and uh, how have other, other cities in similar situations done that? And the final piece will be the report synthesizing all that and as Andy said, laying out options and associated costs to, fur, to uh, spur further conversation uh, among stakeholders for the path forward. Uh, next slide. And the overarching goal is to develop a broadly accepted fact set. We're looking to you know, there are a lot of uh, a lot of opinions. People have very strongly held opinions. People, you know, people are on this river. Uh, people love this river. People are uh, amazed and wanting to take advantage of the water and pro quality improvements that have happened. Um, but we really need to understand, you know, what you know what the water condition is 
what is the, the trajectory and what can we do to, uh, to spur further improvements. We're taking, a, given the complexity and the size of the study area, we're taking essentially a geospatial approach or overlaying, and, and Julia will give you a, a, a tour of this uh, in a few minutes just to give you a taste. Um, basically looking at, you know, pulling data from multiple sources, not just uh, water quality data, but uh, onshore data about, you know, access, equity, environmental justice indicators, uh, as well as, you know, where current uh, recreation is happening, where it might be planned and where there might be opportunities for more equitable access in the communities along this stretch. Uh, and that, that current uh, recreation is what we're seeking your input on now. Um, then we're gonna be looking heavily at the data, understanding trends and correlations. Where are there key data gaps? There will be key data gaps and we'll need to fill those. In order, to, in order to give comfort to many stakeholders uh, that, to move forward. Um, and then identifying opportunities. Um, and I would say, you know, I wanna stress, this is a water quality study, uh, but in order to identify which locations warrant more focused attention, because you know, we're gonna have to zero in on specific locations, either as case studies or whether it's clear opportunity. Um, you know, other factors such as possible access, physical hazards, uh, will inform you know, where more intensive work will be done. We're focused on the water quality, but we can't ignore, ignore uh, the other factors as well. Next slide. So how did we go about assembling this information that we're, we're talking about today? Um, we basically pulled from public sources. Uh, I won't read all that to you. You can see you know, the various agencies. Uh, we looked at aerial imagery to see where there are boat launches, docks, piers, beaches, et cetera. Uh, we did some, some sleuthing, you know, calling, uh, emailing, finding out, you know, who's doing what where, um, and actually did a little, uh, a little social media work as well. Uh, we know this list is not complete, uh, which is why we want to hear from you all to make sure we are, you know, make sure we have a, a very thorough understanding of the geographies where uh, recreation is happening now on the river, because that will inform uh, where we perform additional, uh, additional water quality work. Next slide. Um, and, you know, part of the, uh, because there is going to be so much stakeholder interaction on this, uh, it's designed to encourage a lot of stakeholder interaction. Uh, and because there is a lot of data and a lot of geography involved, now putting these things on the map, uh, you know, from a GIS standpoint and making it accessible to people so people can understand um, the conditions and um, it is gonna be key. And so uh, the folks at Michael Baker uh, are working with us to do, you know, build this into a tool that as we move forward in the, in the uh, project, will be uh, giving people access to play around with. I think it's very illustrative. Um, you know, with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Julia Fine at Michael Baker, who can give us a bit of a, uh, bit of a windshield tour of what we're, uh, uh, what we're working on, just to give you a taste. Good morning, thank you, Carl and Andy, and good morning, everybody. I'm going to just give you a brief introduction with your beautiful faces in the way. Um, into what we have for our data viewer to date. So like um, Carl mentioned, this is a work in progress and we're still gathering the information, but to give you an idea of the information that will be included as we move forward in the study and then also to let you know how we're going to be utilizing this information. Um, this here is the, the GIS-based data viewer. We have some uh, introductory information regarding what the data viewer is and how the sources are public um, generally. Um, we can turn on the face map. And this here is the list of all of the information that we've pulled. So um, when we talk about um, environmental hazards, for instance, you could see areas that are slated industrial or have um, industrial permits. Um, we have looked at um, public access in regards to where um, we have highways and rail lines and 
SEPTA bus stops and uh, New Jersey Patco bus stops to allow people access to the river. All of these things, like Carl said, um, lend towards a place that is easier to access or harder to access for where people want to be doing their recreation so that we can focus the water quality aspect on making sure that people are entering the river um, at a place that you know is the best to do that. So I know that the water quality, um, of course, is a is a major um, piece of this. We have um, in the water quality section, we have uh, all these data sets, including where data has been collected from um, PWD as well as from DRBC. We have the locations of the combined sewer outfalls in the areas as well as municipal. Um, all, so this just gives you a very brief idea of the information that we have. And, and I'm not gonna go into it um, too much at this point, but if we, um, anybody who accesses this data viewer will have the ability to gather some additional information about any of the points, um, similar to you know a typical GIS application, so that you can see all of the data that is incorporated with it, each of these. All the recreation specifically that we have gathered is shown in these black squares um, throughout the, the project area. And we have characterized those broadly under swimming, fishing, or boating. So we have little tiny icons showing those different um, primary activities that are ongoing. And we're happy to see that there's many, many, you know, black squares throughout. And we realize that we will be adding um, some, I'm sure, as the process continues. Um, but this to date is what we have in the viewer. As we move forward with this project, we are gonna be using this to do some GIS analysis um, on the study so that we could easily generate information regarding distance from, for instance, a recreation point, either existing or a proposed recreation point to the nearest CSO or the nearest bus stop or whether or which existing see uh, existing recreation locations are located potentially in areas that are, um, have a, a high social vulnerability index so that we can work towards that equity concern of the project. So all of this information is very informative and will be utilized in regards to analyzing um, the data and how geographically all of the factors play in to each other with a focus, of course, on the water quality aspects and where the CSOs are, where the um, other outfalls are. So um, that's basically the intro <laughs> to this study. Um, similar to other uh, GIS, um, can pull up a little legend so that it's a little more informative and user-friendly for anybody who's us using this. Um, and that is basically, yeah. Does anybody have any questions at this point about this specifically before I stop screen sharing this? One of the things that I'd add, Julie, as well, is that, um, you know, as we get in our water quality information, we'll be looking to do essentially some, to the extent the data allows us some heat mapping mm -hmm. to show, you know, what the water quality data shows us, in particular sampling events, you know, vis-a-vis -vis certain locations, so. Uh, it's the beginning of a, of a spatial idea. Um, um, and, um, you know, I see a comment from Steve with respect to swimming. That's, you know, one of the things we'll need to do, and uh, we recognize this, is, is uh, be very uh, specific as to the source of our information, whether it's anecdotal or public information, obviously. Um, and, um, and make sure we're very careful, you know, given the uh, given the complexities of the conversations around uh, around uh, you know primary and secondary activities. Uh, uh, make sure we're extremely careful as how we're framing that, because we are looking to um, you know 
not wade into that debate as such at this point. We're meant to be informative. And um, as far as the availability of the site, this is not yet public facing. We're just giving a, a windshield tour. We expect once they have a chance to, in, to um, you know, input information from you all with respect to the, uh, with respect to the, you know, the inventory on paper, then I think we're going to be in a position to roll this out and um, and you know get some input from people uh, across the broader stakeholder community about what else you know people would like to see on there. And we've got Q and A at the end as well. So uh, I think probably at this point, if we can hand it to, um, um, if we can hand it to, um, uh, back to Tim, and then we'll get into the Q and A uh, towards the uh, towards the latter half that Don will be coordinating. So thanks, Julia. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Carl. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Andy. Uh, and thanks to everybody for joining us this morning. Um, it's, uh, it's great to see, that, you know, we've done a couple of these sessions so far um, and great to see people are engaged in it because uh, that's really a hallmark of part of the program or part of the project is to um, make sure there's an ongoing interactive dialogue with the stakeholders and the folks, um, the communities that are, uh, that live on the river, whose lives um, are, are intertwined with the river and its future. Um, so it's great to see everybody um, coming together and, and um, availing themselves of the information, which is is really great. I'm, I got a little lost in the roadmap, but you know, when everybody puts a map up, you always kind of look for places you know. Um, so I'm looking forward to playing with that as, as it moves forward. Um, so, you know, I just want to say, uh, first off, I want to thank, uh, there's a couple of students uh, that are joining us today. And um, uh, I think that's really wonderful in addition to the, agency folks and the, those of us who work in the non-governmental organization world um, uh, because you know part of this idea of the terminology of the project of the literal society's part of the project about returning to the river um, you know is that we we have this history of industrialization of parts of the river being shut off of, of, of community or society sort of turning our backs on the values that clean rivers uh, can provide to, to all of us. And, and I think it's really, you know, we're in a, in a tremendous um, moment uh, of re-recognizing the value as the, all the um, improvements that have come about, about because of all the hard work on everybody's part that Andy acknowledged earlier, uh, you, you know, we're really at a place where this river uh, continues to um, to, to make different contributions to our lives and to our communities. Um, and I'm just a big believer that young folks have, you know, they are the future, right? So the fact that they're involved this morning, um, as we try to look at uh, pathways to um, capturing um, those values that, that we believe that clean rivers um, demonstrably provide to the community, to our lives, to our economies, um, and to addressing, uh, as Andy pointed out earlier, this this uh, sort of inequity, where we have this uh, tremendous river system you know, over several hundred miles and a, a very narrow section of it in which the communities adjacent to it um, don't have the same values available to them because of the pollution issues that are there. Um, so, um, you know, many folks who are on this on this call on this webinar. Um, you know, recognize, I think that additional action um, in the near future can be taken to improve the water quality uh, further, building on the, the successes, standing on the shoulders, as is often said of the folks that have gone before us, um, and all the associated societal and economic benefits that come along with that. Um, you know, again, uh, I think there's a moment in that we're facing as a nation about an awakening to uh, racial injustices that have been historically out there. Um, and I think part of this intersects um, with those ideas about um, making this river available um, equally um, for the, the values it can bring to communities, to peoples that may uh, have not had same the same access to it. And ultimately, uh, as Carl 
and you talked about it's about developing a strategy for reducing the bacterial pollution, working with everybody um, to increase the opportunities for swimming and paddling, uh, wading, uh, Carl's pun there at the end about wading into the debate about what those future uses look like. Um, you know, we're, our part of this project is to um, uh, really set out with that goal to increase the opportunities and to um, hopefully help the communities, uh, as we said, um, re-return to the river. And, um, you know, we, we'd always drill down into language. Uh, I don't mean to think that people have ultimately turned their back on this river, you know, in a, in a broad way, because obviously we haven't because the investments have been made. But um, I think we're trying to impart the idea that we can see this in a new framing for the new possibilities that it offers us. So the next slide, please, Sandra. Again, this is the way you've sort of articulated the um, goal around fair and equitable opportunities to get more people more often in more places uh, swimming and fishing and enjoying the 27 mile stretch of the river as it flows past Philadelphia, Camden, and Chester. Next goal. Uh, the, you know, the Literal Society with the able assistance of Verna Harrison Associates has been um, uh, managing the stakeholder engagement part of this to help complement the WCP's technical work and really to help them meet their goals uh, to, to tap into the expertise and the experiences and the deep knowledge all of you have uh, to help inform their work. Um, so this is really just the process for shaping these strategies and these engagement sessions around each of those tabs that Carl described earlier so that they're unique so that um, hopefully the, the right voices um, that represent, you know, long experience um, and understanding uh, are engaged and, and made available um, to the conversation as it goes forward. Um, and then, uh, you know, tactically, so, so to speak, I guess, is this idea of inviting additional stakeholder groups uh, beyond the advisory committee, which is very capably guiding the day-to-day -day work uh, to participate in the review and provide feedback. So this is, really is an invitation um, on the part of the Water Center, on the part of um, the Literal Society to, to provide, you know, your insights. Next slide. Um, again, just some, I, you know, fundamental principles, I would call them, right? Respect the river users and the communities uh, as experts, um, in addition to the, you know, the deep bench that we have in terms of science and law and uh, community planning. Um, there are unique perspectives, I believe, deeply that come from um, the community and from people who use these resources, use this river, um, that, that need to be respected and acknowledged. Um, you know, we're working to make sure we identify and connect stakeholders around each stage of it, create spaces. And I want to thank Sandra and the uh, Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed for our partnership with them and just how ably she's provided these Zoom spaces so we can bring people together um, and, and get an opportunity to provide uh, input and insights back to the, to the water center. And then ultimately looking forward a little bit, you know, this is, a, as, as Carl said, partly an effort to provide a fact set to have this conversation, which we're all engaged in in a couple different places. Um, so we wanna build those relationships um, so, that, so that folks, stakeholders can use that information, carry it forward um, and seek you know, support um, from other decision makers for the implementation steps uh, um, and support and funding in particular, I would think, um, to carry out the implementation of what needs to be done ultimately to help uh, get this river back to swimmable fishable in places where those uses are um, are constrained. So next one. And I, I, I always close these sessions with this image because it just it just embodies to me a lot about what the promise of this effort is. And and I want to thank all of you all for giving you of your time and your thoughts uh, because it, it really hasn't been a tremendous history of the recovery of this river from its polluted state, um, more polluted state. Um, and I just think the potential um, for the future is equally, equally promising. So thank you. So Tim, are we ready to go to questions? I think we are, yeah. Excellent, very good. Well, uh, thanks everyone. This is Don Baum with Upstream Alliance and I'll just be the gatekeeper on questions and uh, uh, some excellent uh, comments coming in the chat box and also some uh, excellent uh, questions. And uh, actually I want to start with one of the comments and uh, 
I'm going to ask uh, Cindy Dunn if uh, Cindy, if you could uh, explain your comment a little bit, and then we'll go to the questions. Yeah, I think uh, as we know, uh, with a changing climate, uh, urban heat is uh, actually the most dangerous uh, weather event. I mean, people think hurricanes and tornadoes kill the most people, but urban heat kills uh, more people than than uh, any other weather uh, phenomenon. Um, this year with the COVID pandemic, we saw record crowds heading to state parks where there were lakes and any, any kind of swimming at all. And even in uh, like less formal swimming opportunities at streams and state forest land, it's like as far away as the uh, Poconos, you know, people coming on day trips from New York City, uh, Philly, Trenton, um, you know, Wilmington, um, it really, frankly, overwhelming these places, uh, doing some ecological damage and overwhelming the resource. And of course, with COVID, in an attempt to try to keep the crowd spread out a bit, um, it was very much a challenge. It just speaks to the need for um, really, uh, really opening up the Delaware, making, you know, continuing the cleanup, the remarkable cleanup, and, and also um, providing access and what we find uh, with the, with our new users, even in like an established place like state parks, if uh, new users need uh, a lot more handholding to to get there, find it, and know what they can do, and also understand stewardship. Uh, so I think uh, one one learning from us is, um, yeah, I think for people who spent their lives, at, you know, going outdoors, that you, you kind of you don't understand what it takes to get uh, new users to a place and comfortable with it and then and then stored it properly and we're we're trying to address that uh, we won't we haven't discovered any magic bullets frankly but we're uh, using social media doing as much as we can making sure uh one, one thing we hear from new users is uh concern about are they welcome and are they safe um and and just overtly uh overtly stating yes you're welcome and uh information about uh, safety. So uh, I, I really applaud this. Uh, this is a tremendous uh, public need. It's, uh, it's more than recreation. It's, it's really uh, life-saving, frankly, when you look at uh, urban heat. You know, have, having a place to get to that's, that's actually walkable um, is a tremendous opportunity. So I applaud this good work. I would like to, I mentioned this to Verna, I'd like, like to have a, a stakeholder forum if we could with uh, some uh, us and some of the agencies we work with that do grant funding for access. Uh, so I don't know what the right timing uh, for that is. I know for us, our next grant round starts in January. Fish and Boat Commission is now um, using part of their discretionary funds for access as well. Tim Schaefer heads Fish and Boat Commission and uh, he would be a really good partner. He and his staff would be a really good partner to get in on that conversation because the state does have some dollars that can help with this and uh, anyway i'm excited by this uh i only wish i had um, put a few thought to get a few of my staff on but if we can do a separate briefing get everyone up to speed at the right time uh, i think we could be helpful uh cindy very very excellent very eloquent and uh, for those that don't know the people from new jersey perhaps that the uh, cindy is the director of the division of conservation and that natural resources and uh having that kind of statement cindy uh to kick off the questions is a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, statement. So thank you. Thanks uh, for having hey, me. Cindy Dunn. Cindy Dunn, right. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask a question to everybody and then open it up to the questions from the chat box. So this is, I want you to try to identify the person that penned this quote. I believe very strongly that getting people to the river, on the river and in the river will make a difference for the advocacy for the water quality of the Delaware River. Anybody know who made that quote? Uh, it's one of my heroes of the Delaware. It's uh, Andy Cricken. So uh, Andy, we applaud your work. And uh, you know, uh, I just know from my work in Camden that uh, I can safely paddle most days of the year over there and swim a lot and do. And uh, thanks uh, on Andy's great shoulders to be able to do that. So the questions. What I'll do is go through more or less in the order that questions appear. Uh, I'll call on you if you could identify who you are and what organization or what you represent, <clears throat> and then uh, uh, obviously taking yourself off mute and ask your question. And I'll start with Skelly Holmbeck. Uh, thanks, Skelly. 
Hey, thanks so much. So I'm Executive Director of the Water Resources Association in the Delaware River Basin. Um, I've got two questions, but I'll start with the one that's on the top, which is, can you talk about the water quality constituents that you're tracking? Yeah, I guess I'll uh, run with that one. We are focused for purposes of this study on bacteria um, because that, uh, you know, and, you know, we're not, uh, you know, stating that there are no other constituents that are uh, of concern, but uh, bacteria appears to be the driver with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, recreation and contact. So that is what we're focusing on. Great, thanks, Carl. And Scarly, I know you have another question, but we'll say that if that's okay for further down in the list, if uh, make sure we have time for others as well. George Ambrose. Hi, I'm George Ambrose from Cops Creek Environmental Center in West Philadelphia and an active member in the uh, Alliance for Watershed Education. And I'm concerned about the impact of dredging and I'm wondering what the current state is of anticipated dredging and what impact that could have. Impact with respect to water quality or is impact with respect to uh, recreational access? as such. Oh, all of the above. Uh, I don't know that we've looked at dredging specifically. Um, it's certainly something that we'd want to, uh, you know, as we're looking at the non-water quality associated physical hazards, we should, uh, you know, we should be aware of, certainly. So thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for that input. And uh, we'll make a point of, uh, of you know, getting our heads around how that might impact. Great, thank you, George, and thank you, Carl. Uh, Jen Atkins. Hi, um, my question is, I'm Jen Atkins. I'm with American Rivers and Clean Water Supply. And um, my question is pretty simple. It's just, uh, when do you think that this data resource, this online data resource might be available to others to use? Uh, I'm thinking, you know, once we have the uh, opportunity to uh, to pull in the input that we're receiving, you know, in this in this event, and some other contents that uh, after the first of the year, uh, but I would stress that this is going. This is a work in progress, and it will be updated as, particularly our water quality work continues, uh, and as you know, more data comes online from, you know, for example, PWD or or DRBC. We'll be incorporating it in so you know hopefully this becomes a platform for the addition of additional work but uh certainly in the first quarter i'd expect to be able to share this with folks julia hopefully hopefully i didn't uh you don't look like your hair is on fire from me saying that so. okay. <laughs> hey and I, and I skipped uh danielle denk i i skipped your question because it was responded to a couple times in the chat but uh, i'll just start uh, let you take yourself off mute make sure that uh, your question was answered as much as you want it to be. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Danielle Dank. I'm with the Trust for Public Land. We've been working in Philadelphia and Camden for a number of years and see a lot of familiar faces. Um, I'm as a boater on the, um, the Delaware, I think my question wasn't necessarily about um, trying to layer in a bunch of hazards on the river, but really to identify where there's safe spots, where there's safe spots for access for swimming, because I think that's going to help us perhaps think about where priority is for, for access around swimming. It's that I 100% agree. It's so important, especially right now. And any way to kind of narrow in on access points that are actually safe for swimming would be tremendous. So thank you. Thanks, Daniel. And that's exactly the kind of input we're looking for. Sorry, Andy, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just um, and the way we see it is just what, what's keeping people out of the river are access and water quality. So we're looking for opportunities to improve water quality, things that have already been committed to, and then maybe some additional things that without, you know, significant rate burden on, on rate payers to improve water quality so that the water quality isn't a barrier. Then also looking for access points, whether it be illegal public access and then also you know, safe public access too. So it, it all comes together. So that's a perfect question. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah, and, but those two are key. I mean, when we're looking at opportunities, you know, the ones that come online first should be places where both access and water quality, you know, the 
you know, the various you know, stakeholders who need to need to agree that, you know, those two things are those two things are there. You know, that's where the focus is going to be kind of overlaying those two. Great. Ellen Kohler. Yeah, hi, I just had, uh, oh, yeah. University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center. Uh, just questions around the advisory, the stakeholder advisory committee, and could you please share the members so that those of us in the working in the watershed can help make connections? You know, there may be folks that know people on the advisory committee and would like to reach out to them um, in terms of being engaged in the project and whether there's more information about the stakeholder engagement process to be able to share with folks so they know when those opportunities are to participate. Maybe that's, maybe that's to come, I don't know, that kind of information would be really, really helpful to get more folks engaged in um, sharing information with you. So I'll, uh, I guess I'll take a crack at that and Verna can jump in as well. Um, so there, there's not a, a sort of, there's not a standing stakeholder committee, which I think I took your question to be asking about um, the the river the return of the river advisory team is the literal society upstream alliance Verna Harrison associates Andy Kraken and Carol Collier um, from the academy as an advisor to us um, and I, I tried to communicate which I guess I, um, we're trying to shape these a little bit uniquely and customize them around each of the tabs that WCP is uh, developing um, so that um, you know the right folks um, um, are involved, and then we will also look as we try to draw this sort of a little bit bigger for opportunities to identify other voices that ought to be included. So, so Cindy's suggestion that we talk specifically to the resource agencies, you know, is a great uh, a great idea to that. Um, so, do you think you might be sharing like what? So I guess what I'm asking, Tim, is if you share like, oh, so here are some of the things we're thinking about, then we, you know, in, in some kind of format, I don't know what that would be, but then we could say, oh, this person would be really great for you. You know, like if we see how this process is developing, we could provide more yeah. input in terms of other folks we might want to reach out to. Sure. Well, we could, I think we could talk off, a little bit more offline if you'd like. Um, I think Carl presented the the tabs, right? So the fundamental focus areas of the research that's being done, and uh, you can take some from that. Um, it, is a, it is a work in progress, um, and it is uh, probably not quite as formalized, perhaps, as some other processes might be in that sense. But um, um, I, I, hear your, I hear your point. Um, I think we reached out uh, almost 200 people and uh, be, were notified about this meeting. So uh, but we obviously want to broaden that net as uh, to use a fishing metaphor as, as far as possible. Um, Carl, the water center has a, a small technical advisory team to them. Mm -hmm. and that is different than our overall stakeholder work. But what we will be doing, and this is a good comment, is trying to work with the water center to put some um, meat around the five or so tasks that Carl outlined and say, okay, in each task, we're going to be looking at A, B, and C. So it's wonderful to be able to put that out. And then if you say, well, gee, you need to contact this person before you finish because they may have information, that's great. We did, we tried hard to do that for this particular recreation activity. Agree, Ellen, uh, or Verna rather. Um, so, uh... Uh, yeah, we can, we, we actually, we can make a point of communicating in more detail, you know, what the specifics are on those various tabs to allow people to get a better feel for what's coming and who, you know, who they think should be at the table. Because we, we want to take advantage to the extent possible of the institutional knowledge that's out there, as opposed to recreating the wheel. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Joanne Douglas, uh, you made a comment. I didn't know if you wanted to pose that in the form of a question or not. So if you do, then please do. And if not, then I'll just keep going. So if you do, just take yourself off mute and ask it. Hi, um, I'm Joanne Douglas, uh, Watershed Interpretation Manager at Bartram's Garden. Um, yeah, so my comment is a little bit of a question too, and it's more um, around like coming from an outreach perspective and um, 
basically, I guess what I'm asking is with the returning to the river, if there's any uh, room for evolving the title of the project, um, just because there are some concerns that um, like returning to the river requires some type of knowledge that, you know, the river looked differently beyond, you know, before your lifetime, um, or that it, it excludes people who are already engaging with the river in ways that are main, maybe not safe, but that it is still very much a big part of their lives. Um, yeah, so just maybe some discussion around like, is it more like increasing safe spaces on the river or something of that nature, rather than returning to some point in time that just may not be relevant to everyone. Um, and then the other um, kind of uh, ask to evolve the language around um, just some of the ways that we list engagement of the river. So it's a lot of the times it's swimming, paddling, boating, um, when there's also like people are using the river for subsistence, they're using the river for ceremony. Um, and that, uh, I'm just bringing that up because there are people that live adjacent to the river um, or folks that are, you know, using the river in ways that aren't as visible, that could be um, our biggest advocates and to not list what they're doing or not make it broad enough that they can see themselves in it um, may cut out a large amount of people that could really be a big help. Yeah, so I uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I welcome that conversation and, and your wisdom and guidance on it um, because none of the sort of negative aspects of what you just raised were in any way our intention, right? I mean, this is to try to be as inclusive and um, uh, of all the uses in, the, in all the communities. Uh, so uh, to the extent that we should modify, shape the language to better reflect that um, and respect what's happening in people's relationships, I, I'm all for that. And I would, I would just ask for your guidance on it. I'm happy to have that conversation. I, I agree 100%, uh, Joanne. This is definitely, it's an environmental project, but I see it also very much as a social justice project. Uh, Philadelphia, Camden and Chester are three of the most economically distressed communities in the entire country. And the, the aim of this is that you know, there's 250 miles or so of the Delaware River, and this is the only 27 mile stretch in the whole Delaware that doesn't have water quality that matches the other 225 odd miles. And so people in Philadelphia, Camden and Chester have the same right to have clean water flowing past their cities and access to the, to the river uh, as possible. So this is, and, and to do it in a way that doesn't adversely impact their rates doesn't you know, over, overly burden their rates because the, you don't want to burden low-income communities while uh, you know, restoring the river. So um, we definitely uh, see it that way and we'll you know, want to take a look at, uh, at that. Maybe restoring the river might be a better way to put it, I don't know, or that, or that sound, if that resonates better to you. Yeah, um, yeah, I, th I think like restoring, um, opening up, like just there's, I'm not really sure yet, like I would have to think about it a little bit more, and I think it is a conversation, um, but just something that isn't, um, that again, like you were saying, doesn't burden communities where they have to do more work to fix what has been broken, mostly not by them, um, but still opens it up to that people recognize that, okay, this, I know, I know that this means it's also for me, it's not just for people who are going to be like, building housing or now coming to the river because of a beautiful trail, but this is, this includes me and includes the ways that I'm already using the river. That's totally I want to thank um, Danielle Redden for um, bringing some of those points to our uh, attention uh, a couple of days ago, and we have already begun to talk about it. So this is the kind of thing that's makes comments so valuable. Thank you. I just want to, thanks, Vernon. I just want to, I want to add, Joanne, that your, your comments are spot on. And I think the thing is, is because of Philadelphia, Camden, and Chester's unique, uh, not unique, but unusual or an anachronistic, really, combined sewer systems, you know, old fashioned sewer systems, that is the, probably the data suggests there's more data needed, suggests that's the reason why this 27 mile stretch is more impaired than, than upstream and downstream. So there is a lot more work to be done in this area than anywhere else. But as you said, that should not be done as a burden to low-income people in, this, in, in, in these communities. You have to find a way to improve the water quality without adversely impacting rates. So that, it's, this is an environmental justice project very much. 
I just want to reflect for people that don't know, uh, by far the two biggest uh, public programs that uh, use the water uh, for on water recreation is Bartram's Garden, where Joanne works, as well as uh, Independence Seaport. They dwarf the other users. And uh, uh, also, the call from Bartram's Garden is Daniel Redden, who has an excellent uh, comment. I won't call on you, uh, Daniel. I just want people to take a look at it about swimming. Uh, she was the one who started the boathouse there. It's a really wonderful program, so and a very deeply rooted in the community. Uh, so just to keep going with the questions, uh, we'll only have a time, unfortunately, for a couple more, but great, great questions out there. Jim Cummings. Thank you, and, and thank you, Joanne. So I have a question from a student. I'm with Urban Promise, and uh, Don, on the New Jersey side, uh, you want to mention Urban Promise and the Center for Aquatic Sciences in this area for uh, doing programming on the river. And um, something I, you know, I think is important to say, in the community of Camden and the young people that I work with, um, you know, a term that I hear is uh, environmental racism. Um, and that's kind of harsh, I think, for some of us. You know, we, we use language, social justice, environmental justice. Um, in these communities, um, there's a different perception. Um, and one of my students, who's currently a freshman at Rowan University, Yasiria, worked uh, with us as a river guide for several years uh, while in high school. Um, and she's been on the Delaware, from the Delaware Water Gap uh, on down. And um, she ha has a question for all of us and is what, what can she as a young person, what can the uh, young people of Camden, Philadelphia and Chester, how can they be involved and what can they do? Um, you know, I look at all the wonderful faces. There's not a lot of people of color that uh, are speaking to these issues. Um, and I think as, as Joanne brings up and others uh, have said as well, um, how do we invite them into the conversation uh, and, and help them find active ways to participate? <laughs> um, because I, I think those words in, in environmental racism are important to really understand. Um, and I think sometimes that's difficult for us on the other side of the road to really identify with. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, I'll try to shout out that. Uh, um, I couldn't agree with you more, Jim. I, you and I worked together in Camden for many years, and uh, that's, I mean, our, our mutual friend, Father Michael Doyle, used to talk about the work that, the most important work was to make sure that the children of Camden and cities like Camden, you know, had the same access and the same rights and the same opportunities that people elsewhere had. Um, and so I think there's two things, you're right. One is we have to solve this problem they do have the same opportunities that people upstream and downstream of this 27 mile stretch have and the same for the people in Philadelphia and Chester. We also have to find a way to get them involved. Maybe we could get your help and maybe like with Brian Duvall who's on the call and, and others, how to make like a, I don't know, like a young, a young person's committee that helps, you know, um, as a stakeholder group, you know, you know, that would help advise our groups and, and provide input. Maybe we could brainstorm on, on how we could get uh, people that we could help the young people to help us and become a voice in this, this discussion. What do you think? Uh, I love the idea, Andy. We're all in. That's great. Well, I'll, I'll reach out to you and then we'll, we'll, we'll be able to see who could be a committee that could help identify young, you know, youth, especially youth from Philadelphia, Camden, and Chester, that could be a stakeholder group in this discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have to add Jim. that we've, we've had some conversations with the Riverway collaboration already about that, so I'm delighted to hear um, Jim bring it up. Yeah, Jim, I would just, I would just re reinforce that by saying, you know, we are absolutely open to that. And I actually would not want to sort of provide the answer. I'd like to hear from the young people as to you know, what reflects the best way that they see themselves being involved in the stewardship of their community, you know, so that I'm not the guy to define that, right? But I can, I'm, I am more than open, my heart is open, my mind is open to ways to do that, and I'd like to hear that, so. Yeah, and, and I believe that is the case as well. 
Hey, I'm going to, to uh, round out the, the, the questions here, if that's okay, with a comment, and then I'll turn it over for, for last comments from the panelists and to wrap it up. Uh, but uh, just to reflect, there are many, many questions that came through here, and I know that uh, Verna is going to be posting these questions and uh, responses to those questions uh, uh, afterwards, so she'll mention that in the wrap-up. But uh, the quote I'd like to end with, uh, referencing uh, what we just heard about in Camden, and uh, thank you, Andy, for bringing up Father Michael Doyle. It's a quote from Father Michael Doyle, which I think applies to Philadelphia as well as Camden as well as Chester, uh, which is, uh, I, Camden's mother is the Delaware River. Camden will never be whole again until it reunites with its mother. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to Verna, uh, Carl, Tim, Andy for the wrap up and uh, last comments. So the, thanks, Donna. I'm kind of tempted to say we ought to end it right there on those words, because <laughs> because uh, I think the uh, I'm not sure I can add anything more. Uh, but I, I I guess I want to thank everybody. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Water Center in particular for presenting the information and uh, making the tools available to um, provide people with an opportunity to re-embrace their mother, to you know to be whole with their mother again. Um, and uh, I, you know, I think I hope we've communicated that this isn't a sort of ongoing dynamic process, and we're very open to hearing, you know, suggestions and information, um, and we're going to try to facilitate the flow of that. Um, uh, so uh, I, again, I thank everybody for taking their time. I know time is our most precious resource, um, and I look forward to you know we will be answering the questions that we didn't get to today. Um, and as, as Carl suggested, there's further interaction to come, right? Um, so um, we'll, we'll look forward to that. I, I, I want to uh, thank everybody for their time and their interest and their commitment. Mm -hmm. Everyone on this, this call is, is, is dedicated to making uh, the river a better place uh, for people and for the environment. And I'm excited about what comes next. I think that this is a great, was a great call. Thanks to Sandra uh, and Verna for setting this all up and for everybody's hard work. And I'm really excited about working together with everybody. And I, thanks to my friend, Jim Cummings for his great idea about a, a youth advisory committee that will be, uh, uh, wanna definitely wanna uh, pu pull that together. And I already have a couple of volunteers that have agreed to, to start. Thanks Danielle and um, there'll be others too. So I'm really excited. Thanks everyone. So I, I think that uh, I think that's that ends our session. Thanks to Sandra. Thanks to Carl. Uh, thanks to Julia. And uh, as always, thanks to Andy and Don and, and Verna for their work on this. Uh, and and thanks to Nathan and the William Penn Foundation for for making this possible. Right. Uh, I, I never want to forget their generosity and the work that they did to, to improve our lives. And in, in this river, both both our natural lives and in our lives within the communities um, around Philadelphia, Camden, and so. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Stay safe, stay distanced, unfortunately, but uh, be healthy. Bye now. Thank you. Nathan, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Take care. Thank you. Stay safe.